Marvel Comics is, has been really um, fantastic about giving us the whole history, teaching us everything we could ever want to know about the characters. Watching the movies and going, ah, oh, that wasn't quite right if they just stayed a little closer to the source material. So part of our being there was saying, guys, how far are we away from the source material? How do we steer it back? Is it okay to steer away this way? And how do we just make this the best possible movie? Didn't I didn't read any comics or do any research. I wasn't familiar with comics. I wasn't familiar with the movies. First thing I was told is don't read the comics. What happened to you? 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 What what happened to you? What happened to you? What happened to you? Now this is podcast. Welcome, girls and boys. We saw your humble servant. And last time, we chatted about how far the MCU has fallen. From the heights of storytelling bliss that Iron Man offered us, hopeless depths of our modern MCU. As solid writing and following classic storytelling ingredients is what separates Iron Man from that loaded diaper of MCU Phase 4 and now 5. That with Iron Man, because the characterization and the plot were executed so well, more things that we'll be discussing today. Iron Man was not just a good superhero movie, but it was simply good. And with a solid movie like Iron Man, the MCU had an incredibly firm foundation to build the rest of the MCU on. But now as the days passed, the lessons learned from this success, they've been lost, and we've got an MCU Phase 4, and now 5, that fills you with no wonder. Just let us die. An MCU Phase 4, and now 5, that has characters and events that nobody cares about. Who? An MCU Phase 4, and now 5, that has these static characters go on journeys to nowhere with characters that stand for nothing. An MCU Phase 4, and now 5, that don't tell stories, but they just completely spell everything out for you while still having a plot that somehow absolutely makes no sense. And the results of all this? Marvel's empire that was once built with the sturdiness of gems, but now every new brick that is laid is of a quality of manure that will inevitably make this behemoth crumble. And I think a lot of us may agree, maybe this behemoth already has. Does the Hindenburg ring any bells? And we will be going deep into the other classic storytelling ingredients that lead us as to why even your grandma loves Iron Man. But I need to first set the scene for us from where we left off last time. Because we were discussing how after Tony Stark was taken hostage, Jensen, who had sort of become Tony's mentor, he forced Tony to think about his legacy. He helped Tony realize that if Tony died, that his legacy would be how his great weapons supplied terrorists and how his weapons were used to kill his fellow Americans. That is your legacy, Stark. Your life's work in the hands of those murderers. Is that how you want to go out? Which is not too great. So Tony gets busy trying to escape and turn his situation around. But the only way that Tony would be able to escape is if Jensen laid down his life to give Tony a second chance. And as Jensen gave his final words, he leaves Tony with one final command. Don't waste it. 
Don't waste your life. So as Tony listens to Jensen and does not want to waste his second chance at life, Tony is moved to dramatically change his ways because when he returns to the US, he immediately, immediately as in, he doesn't even wait to uh, stop at home first, immediately as in, Burger King is the only pit stop between being a hostage in a cave and this press conference. Immediately, he goes to a press conference where he announces that he will halt Stark Industries' weapons manufacturing and trade. And as Tony is given this press conference, he is sort of explaining his decisions and he's rooting his decision all in this idea of accountability. Remember that word there, accountability is... It's going to come up again in a sec, but yes, uh, Tony centers his reasoning behind halting the weapons trade all around accountability. Because Tony connects zero accountability within his company with the events of seeing the young Americans killed by the very weapons I created to defend them and protect them. And I saw that I had become part of a system that is comfortable with zero accountability. But that accountability that Tony promised gets thrown right back into his face as Miss Reporter Lady approaches Tony and shows some pictures as evidence that Stark Industries is being dirty and corrupt and dealing under the table. Is this what you call accountability? That Stark Industries is selling weapons to both the U.S. government and to the Ten Rings, that terrorist organization that they are indeed fighting. And as sort of a, a quick aside, I think Iron Man sort of handles the subject of the puppeteering within war a whole lot better than that Star Wars movie where Luke Skywalker was drinking elephant milk. Because... Iron Man has a whole lot more to say than uh, just the statement that rich people equal bad. I wish I could put my fist through this whole lousy, beautiful town. But enough with Disney Star Wars, because we have more pressing matters to handle. As Miss Reporter Lady, she is interrogating Tony. And when she does we are led to experience further a uh, foundational factor in our fantastic uh, film framework. And this is the storytelling idea that Mr. Pixar man Andrew Stanton refers to as two plus two, not four, or the unifying factor of two plus two. Meaning that when a story is trying to communicate something, don't treat your audience like babies. Don't dumb things down for them and make them overly simple. Or don't be outright and direct and give your audience an answer of four, but give them understandable clues like two and two so they can follow along and realize, oh, two and two equal four. instead of flat out telling your audience four. For a negative example of four, in episode five of Ahsoka, Ahsoka has a, a dream about when she was younger and in the lamest statement imaginable, she exclaims, this is the Clone Wars. Well, I'm glad you're here to tell us these things. Now on episode of, I think it was on open bar the little platoon he he made a kind of a funny point where he said that he was so certain that when the allies were storming the beaches of Normandy he was certain that during that dramatic event that a soldier had to pause and wait a second look around and yell this is world war II! And maybe if you're sort of struggling to get the point I'm trying to get across here, having Ahsoka yell, this is the Clone Wars, is sort of demeaning to the audience because it's communicating that the show thinks that we are too dumb to realize that when we are seeing Anakin, 
running around with a bunch of clone troopers, uh, fighting battle droids, and also Ahsoka looks like 30 years younger, that we are too stupid to realize that this story is set during the Clone Wars. Maybe another more subtle example of just giving us four instead of two and two that I thought was pretty neat, which was brought up by Fringy on an EFAP TV episode covering Loki Season 2, Episode 2. Because they were discussing how unnecessary it can be to have a subtitle appear on screen to tell you the setting of a scene. Because in Loki Season 2, it has a, a, a text appear on screen that tells you that the scene is set in Broxton, Oklahoma in 1982. Which may seem harmless to you, but you should also ask, why is it there? Does it need to be there? Does it being there enhance the story? Because in a sense, that subtitle is just given you an answer of four, because the show thinks that you are not able to solve the riddle of the setting yourself. Even though the first, so the first shot in that scene in Loki has an American flag, an American pickup truck, with a license plate showing what state it's in, in a McDonald's parking lot that's clearly styled like a, a Mickey D's from the late 20th century. And all of this is across the street from uh, a rural farm looking field. So with all of that evidence laid before us, you don't really have to be a genius to realize that this isn't taking place in, I don't know, Chicago or Wakanda or Asgard. And in Loki, there's really no implication for uh, which rural town the McDonald's that Lady Loki works in. It doesn't really matter which town it happens in. But if it is crucial to the plot that the audience knows which state or town in America that this takes place in, you can have the camera maybe focus in on the, the pickup truck's license plate or maybe have one of your characters bring up the location naturally in conversation. And maybe I should clarify a little bit that this instance here in Loki is much more of a minor criticism. And even Iron Man, I, I think about it, there is some text that appears on screen to clarify that the setting switches from Las Vegas to Malibu from the, the first night to the second morning. But this principle, this overall idea of two plus two is important because it pushes a story further and further. It pushes up from maybe passable to okay to good to excellent because it keeps your audience's immersion in the fictional world maintained instead of... Oh, actually, I think I thought of another example. That's also in the MCU because in Shang-Chi and the Legend of the Ten Onion Rings, there's a moment where immersion is broken as it felt like the story had to stop and uh, tap me on the shoulder, like it was sort of breaking the fourth wall, as it had Aquafina say to her best friend, we had been friends for 10 years. We've been friends for 10 years. Yes, totally natural way to give us this information. Because every time I see my best friend, I always announce how long I've known them, where I've met them before, and describe all of their classic character traits. Which is also what Shang-Chi does in the next scene. Remember the swap, remember my but because Iron Man is not a stupid movie, as Ms. Reporter Lady is interrogating Tony, she shares a smaller detail about these attacks that are in these photos. And this scene sort of rewards those in the audience that are paying attention and makes the revelation of Stark Industries selling weapons to the Ten Rings hit like a sock full of batteries to your tummy, which is this. When Miss Reporter Lady confronts Mr. Stark, she says, It's a town called Galmira. Heard of it? And why this statement is important is because if you go back about 50 minutes-ish earlier in the film, Tony asks Jensen where he is from, and Jensen responds with, I'm from 
some small town called Gomira. It's actually a nice place. Now this is a smaller detail, but it isn't a blink and you miss it either. It hits the perfect balance of rewarding audience members that are paying attention and are able to finish the equation of two plus two because Tony would be triggered in the first place to hear that his company is doing dirty business. But the included detail that it is killing people in Gomira gives extra personal fuel to Tony's fire and why he is all the more fuming over these photos. You know, whereas if Iron Man, if this movie were made today, when Miss Reporter Lady, that lady, I, I like it a, a bit edgy, a bit edgy, but you know, if she went ahead and, and handed Tony Stark those photos, Tony Stark, that man right there, I have a lot of respect for him, but if this movie was made today, you know how you would respond? You would say, hey, I knew a guy who saved my life and his family. That man's family was from Gomira. That nice family from Gomira. That, that right there is why I'm upset. I'm disturbed, it hurts me badly. And another example of two plus two occurs when Tony, he confronts and faces Obadiah about the double dealing of the Stark weapons. Now, Obadiah is not surprised by the news whatsoever. And in sort of a power move, he calmly reacts, showing that he's the one in control of the situation, proclaims that it's picture time, taking a paparazzi picture with Tony while he unveils what's really been going on here with a smile on his face and totally unafraid of the public. Hey, who do you think locked you out? I was the one who filed the injunction against you. Now I won't pretend like this is one of the craziest, insane plot twists in history. I'm the spy. But being a um, clever, completely unexpected reveal is not really what I'm alluding to with uh, 2 plus 2. But Iron Man does execute this setup structure well by giving the audience hints that someone is dealing under Tony's nose under that table. But also gives just enough plausible deniability to not blatantly show the film's hand from the start. Like when we first encounter the Ten Rings using Stark weapons, you can't really know for certain how the Ten Rings got them. You know, those guns could have just as likely fallen off the truck. But Iron Man clues us in a tad more and gives us a, a little bit more intel. Like when Tony is being pushed to make the Jericho missile by the Ten Rings, Tony uh, comments about the, the vast quantity of Stark weapons that they have stashed there. And also in the next scene when Tony asks Jensen who the Ten Rings are, he responds with, They are your loyal customers, sir. So we know that it wasn't like a one-time coincidence that the Ten Rings got those weapons. So even when Tony is saved and back home, he is mighty skeptical and smells all of the fishy, smelly smells, those smelly smells there, and the story reminds us of this dynamic going on. By having Tony comment to Jarvis that he actually doesn't know who really to trust right now. Yet with this sketchy situation here, we don't have a verifiable culprit. We don't have the answer for, because there is just enough plausible deniability surrounding the big guy. Tony. Tony? Sorry, Tony. We Tony. 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 I'll be in the shop. Hey, 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 Tony. It is suspicious that Obadiah didn't go to the weapons presentation, but you know, maybe he couldn't make it to the make it to the Middle East that weekend because he had a barbershop appointment to attend to, or maybe at a, a gender reveal party he needed to go to. It is suspicious that Obadiah didn't invite Tony to the most important board of directors meeting in the company's history, but I'm also sure Tony does have a reputation for missing important meetings and it also may not be the best idea for Tony to travel across the country from uh, Malibu to New York. And Tony probably does need to stay home, rest up a bit, because, you know, 
the guy did almost just die. And Obadiah, he brought pizza back, so how could Tony be really in that bad of shape? And it is suspicious that Tony is getting locked out of his company. But also, when you want to cease a major company's main source of revenue, it sort of seems reasonable that they would want to cut him out of the picture. And it is suspicious that the board of directors and the press are both running with the same narrative that Tony is mentally unwell, which you, which you see in the news. But on the other hand, the guy did experience something quite traumatic, and even his best friend kind of thinks that Tony's losing it. Is suspicious that Tony Stark isn't invited to the Tony Stark party, but again, his job right now is to lay low, rest up, avoid the public. So there is a lot of sus around Stark Industries, but again, just enough plausible deniability that this ruse is not blatantly obvious to us. We don't just straight up get told the number four. And the movie earns having a reveal that Tony had been betrayed by his father figure. And even more surprising that Obadiah would just straight up admit to it. And this here leads to something very special to happen. But before we get to the next narrative ingredient to storytelling success, we need to hear a word, an important message from our valued sponsors. Who's that Pokemon? Reese's Puffs, Reese's Puffs. I saw this boat in half. It's Krabby. Ooh, now I teased you earlier that something very special was about to happen. Ooh. Let me first, again, quickly set the stage for you. Tony is he's confronting Obadiah about the weapons in Gomira, and thus far, Tony has been relentlessly characterized as the guy who has a response to everything. He thinks quick on his feet, and he frankly never shuts up. And he talks his way in and out of every situation. And we sort of partially been adhered to him by his wit. But now that Obadiah drops this bombshell on Tony. Tony is left utterly speechless. Beginning a segment in Iron Man that showcases storytelling in its purest, most universal form through verbalist storytelling. Because now when you strip away language, having to interpret dialogue in a story, the story becomes simplified and focused as the movie now has to rely on the posture and expression of its characters to impart meaning on us. As this fast-paced, high-thrilling action movie paralyzes our hero, leaving him silently still for 30 seconds in defeat, with devastating emptiness in his eyes. And this transition us to him quietly sitting on the couch. But this time, his demeanor has changed a little bit. He's no longer sitting there idly, but he's uh, delicately yet aggressively turning, tuning his armor. And as he is in front of the TV, he's listening to the reports of his enemy's crimes, what Obadiah has helped the Ten Rings do there in Gomira. And as he's listening to this, you can see the repulsors in his hands light up and sort of react in tandem with the fiery anger that Tony has in his eyes, showing us that both Tony and his suit are one. They're connected because both he and his suit are powered by his heart. And as the news reporter he's listening to goes into more and more detail about what's going on and the hopelessness of the situation in Gomira, Tony reacts with an outburst of frustration and aggression, letting out a blast from his repulsors that destroys a light fixture in his uh, garage there, which also gives him a bit of a eureka moment. Because 
uh, since Tony had come back from uh, being a hostage, he has been adamant that his suit would not be used as a weapon. But after blasting his repulsors while hearing about Gomira, Tony again, his demeanor has changed. He is no longer feels defeated or helpless because he knows he can be the one to do something about it just as Yinsen wanted. Because, and this is really key here, as Tony hears the news reporter ask the question, who? But anyone will help. Tony looks at his own reflection in the glass and knows that he has to be the one to answer that call. And as Tony is suiting up, he's not chatting with Jarvis, calling Pepper, or threatening his dummy robot. But he is mute. Even as a million different assemblies are happening around him to suit him up, he is not distracted for a moment, but he is stone cold. He's focused on how he is going to enact justice on the Ten Rings. And the hype doesn't end here because, oh baby, our stint with verbalist storytelling keeps on going and keeps on giving because if you remember that a strength of verbalist storytelling is in its universal nature. A story that everyone can understand and be moved by, well, the scenes here in Gomira make exceptional use of that quality because there is nothing more universal than the value of family and the anger towards those who are dismantling it. And although the characters do have dialogue in these scenes, the movie here is natively in English, so it's sort of assumed that the general audience don't have a specific understanding of what's being said. But again, that is irrelevant because the point is that anyone, anywhere can empathize with the injustice of a son being ripped from his father's arms. And anyone can see that these families are in need of a hero. So once Iron Man obliterates these losers in silence, it is so supremely satisfying, especially when Tony at last breaks his silence, only to say, He's all yours. Now this silent, stark stretch vastly elevates the film because of how it influences our perception of Tony's character. Because having him say less actually reveals more. We are able to see how he is impacted by the pain of others, but more commendable than that, how he is actually willing to do something about it. Because we don't all love Tony Stark because he is a big man in a suit of armor, or because he's a genius billionaire playboy philanthropist, but because he is a hero who is dedicated to protecting those in harm's way. And after Tony saved those families, now Tony goes after his Jericho missiles that were stolen. But as he does so, he gets shot out of the air by a tank. And what happens next? Well, just might be one of the most iconic sequences ever. And as this quintessential staple of a like a boss meme, let me take the time to remind you that the best way to exuberate machismo, dominance, and belittle your pathetic opponents is to turn your back on the poor schmucks and not even look at them. So as Iron Man walks away from the tank, we have been forced to swallow a huge dose of another vital prescription to motion picture mastery that is potent, yet also somehow a, a bit harder for us to pin down. And that is the need for wonder within a film, where a tremendous amount of magic in movies stem from.
and Iron Man invests heavily into the idea of wonder, risks all of its biscuits in the importance of wowing their audience, making them go crazy whenever you say ka -chow. And this is seen through how intentional these moments are placed throughout the movie. From us witnessing the Jericho missile demonstration, bringing down the mountains at the start of the film, to the power of the Mark I head as it was terrorizing those helpless henchmen in the cave, and then you get the, the wraparound shot to reveal the Mark I, and uh, then also this great reversal when he's getting shot at by a million uh, gunshots when he leaves the cave, he stops, he yells, my turn, before he uses his flamethrower, and then, you know, he blasts out the area engulfed in flames, and later, when we experience the satisfaction of Tony in his garage learning to use the basics of his powers. The scene peaks as he turns the kind of away towards the camera and says, Yeah, I can fly. And these wowing moments become the most indulgent with Tony's long, elongated and dynamic suit-ups. As the film lets you sit with the Mark III's assembly for 50 51 seconds, letting us marvel at what Tony had created through beholding all 450 intricate parts of the armor all coming together. But I'd argue that the purest wonder comes from the most innocent and childlike scene. As Tony, he's giddy and screaming through going through the air flying. And then through Iron Man's first flight, it wows a kid into the point of dropping his ice cream cone as he's on a Ferris wheel. And I sort of think that John Favreau's comments behind the intention behind the flight scenes really shows how much uh, him and his team prioritized tapping into the wonder that comes inside a good movie. I think just the feeling of flying for the first time in a movie like this, if you handle it right, should give you chills. Just seeing him fly, really feeling like you're flying with him, if you cover it the right way, shoot it the right way, and present it to the audience in the right way, it should be an emotional experience. What would it really be like to get in a suit that could fly? It would be a life-changing experience. Don't lose sight of that, you're making a movie. And movies are about emotion. They're about allowing the audience to experience something they can't in real life. And seeing other characters being filled with wow is actually a pretty great way to pull that from your audience and get them to relate. Like how in the final act of the movie, Rhodey gets to finally lay his eyes on the suit and his reaction is... That's the coolest thing I've ever seen. Not bad, huh? Now, this here is a type of line that can easily go south as you're sort of indirectly kind of telling your audience what to think. But this here comes across as authentic because we, as an audience, have been sort of reacting the exact same way as Rhodey has to Iron Man this whole time. And we feel, we feel a little sense of giddy of sort of sharing something we've experienced with someone else because both Terrence Howard and I are both bamboozled with delight out of how spectacular the Iron Man suit is. Next time, baby. Contrasted with um, a, a similar setup we had in Avengers Endgame, where I'll give respect where it's due. Chris Hemsworth, he, he does do his part. He, he gives Thor a, a stellar line delivery saying to Captain Marvel, I like this one. But because this is not quite what most people have been thinking about Captain Marvel, this interaction is counterfeit, almost like Marvel execs are putting words into Thor's mouth. I like this one. And trying to convince us to adopt the hopeful new face of the adventures. <laughs> And speaking about turning a spectacle into a scam, the same can be said about visual effects and choreography. Because a lot of wonder can be drawn from audiences saying yes when asked, do you believe that what's happening on screen 
looks like what's happening on screen. Does this look like a guy is flying through the air with jets chasing him? Yes! Does it look like this dude is hovering in the air? Oh, yeah. Does this look like a woman exploding off a helicopter? <laughs> you serious? Thus, bringing your audience out of the movie, and when attempting to fill your viewers with wonder, being inauthentic, forced, and phony is the biggest reminder that none of this story is real, the magician's trick is actually kind of lame, and the ventriloquist's lips are clearly moving, and any sense of wonder and infatuation is down the toilet. And again, Favreau and his team understood this idea and made sure that this movie felt authentic, as this outdated movie from 2008 embarrasses all of these modern movies. I think people have been seeing wire work for so long that whether consciously or subconsciously they could tell where the pick points are, they could tell where the wires are attached, and even if you use you know, computers to paint everything out, there's something about the physics of it that is unconvincing to me. And I was very skeptical if we could use it at all or if we take the audience out of the movie. What we did was we developed a way by which the character was picked or supported by his feet. So he wasn't being suspended by a center of gravity or his hips or his back, as is usually done in these films. His feet are supporting his weight. So it actually looks like he's being supported by the blast of the repulsors in the bottom of his boots. And you could see the dynamics as he's flying through the air feels much truer to what the real physics of flying being powered by your feet would be. So we talked about wonder, but as movie magic can be a bit subjective, we now move to a topic that strives for logic. One that wants us to ask if our movie makes any sense. Wow. As it's time to finish our dish with our final ingredient that is detailed coherency. And when dealing with the fiction of invincible flying robot men taking down armies, it is all the more important for storytellers to get the details right, even the smaller ones. Because when you are asking someone to buy into the unbelievable, you need all the other details of the world to line up, to work, to be consistent, for them to buy in. And if you fail to prove to your audience that your movie makes any sense, just like Wonder, you'll be taking your audience out of the movie, leaving them frustrated, unimpressed, and, oof, bored. Like how in Doctor Strange Mom, you have a witch confronted with a shield that nullifies all magic. But the solution to taking down the shield is to use more magic. Right. Or when you trap. It's a trap. That same witch in an inescapable mirror dimension. But then she just decides to leave the inescapable dimension. That makes sense to me. But if instead of any of this slop, you take special care to get the details correct and set up scenarios where there's cause and effect going on, it is even easier for the audience to buy into the illusionary trip that you are taking them on. And with Iron Man, well, we have Favreau hitting us with a, another banger of a quote. Allowing the audience to experience something they can't in real life but let them experience it in a real way. And that's the hope. The hope is to, to ground this thing in reality wherever we can because it's so superhuman. These heroes are so larger than life that any opportunity we could find to sort of screw it down to reality. An example of this is how both times that Tony left his prison cave cell, he was hooded. Uh, he, he couldn't see and he had no reference for what the rest of the cave looked like. He and Yinsen, then when they, every time they left the cave, they counted their steps whenever they left in order to plan their escape. 
because it would make sense that they wouldn't know which direction to run to. So when Tony is suiting up in the Mark I, Jensen rehearses with Tony the route he needs to take to leave the cave. Jensen tells him, Say it again. And Tony responds with, 41 steps straight ahead. 16 steps, that's from the door, fork right. 33 steps, turn right. Or how about because the writers of the story want Tony to have agency and to break himself out of captivity instead of, you know, instead of waiting for just Tony to wait to be rescued. The writers included Jensen explaining the fact that where the Ten Rings are located at, they will never be located and saved by the U.S. military. I'm sure they're looking for you, Stark. They will never find you in these mountains. Yet, because Tony set off an absolutely ginormous explosion during his escape, Tony was able to point the U.S. military in the right direction and find it him. There was no coincidence or arbitrary result here. There was cause and effect. Or how at the end of Tony and Obadiah's their final fight, the story wants to raise tension and lead to the payoff of Tony sacrificing himself to bring down Obadiah. So there is plenty of reasons given as to why these two characters are unable to kill each other. It's not an arbitrary series of events, like, I don't know, somehow Palpatine returned. But instead, this fight has a consistent flow of cause and effect. They include Tony telling Pepper he is almost out of power. Forcing Tony to get up close to Obadiah, which then leads to Tony, the highly experienced engineer, he mockingly yells, This looks important! Right before ripping out cables in Obadiah's suit. We are then shown that Obadiah, from his perspective, that he cannot see, which clearly communicates its effects on Obadiah's ability to, you know, both see and aim, that causes Obadiah to remove most of his armor so he's able to eyeball his next shot, which both delays Tony's defeat because reasonably Obadiah is less accurate trying to eyeball it. And also, Obadiah needs to open up parts of his armor that leaves Obadiah mortally susceptible to a humongo blast when that poor bald man falls into the arc reactor. Actually, he's not a poor man. He's quite wealthy. But I can go on and on and on with more examples. But I'm sort of getting tired and Mr. Sleepy is calling my name. So, to wrap up, uh, please go and watch and support Madam Web. Thanks for watching Duck Finder on YouTube. I hate ducks.